Good evening, everyone, and thank you for being here. And welcome to what is the 11th installment of the OP Jindal Distinguished Lectures. Uh, if for those of you who don't know me, I'm Bhrigu, Bhrigu Pati Singh, uh, Assistant Professor in the Department of Anthropology at Brown and Associate Director of the Center for Contemporary South Asia here at the Watson Institute. Before I introduce our distinguished speaker, uh, I just wanted to say a few words about the Jindal lectures and the genesis of these lectures. Uh, Sajjan and Sangeeta Jindal, Brown Parents 2012, have endowed these lectures in perpetuity uh, in the memory of Mr. O.P. Jindal, Sajjan's deceased father. The purpose of the endowment is to promote a discussion of politics, economics, culture, and social change in modern India here at Brown. The lectures are held once a semester. The previous lecturers have included leading historians such as Ram Guha and Nayanjot Lahiri, uh, as well as others less bound by disciplines like Ashish Nandi, one of India's leading thinkers and street fighters, as he calls himself, William Dalrymple, writer and founder of the Jaipur Literary Festival, Montek Singh Aluwalia, an economist and policymaker, Pratap Bhanu Mehta, leading political philosopher and public intellectual, and Kaushik Basu, an economist at the World Bank, whose book based on his Jindal lectures was published by MIT Press. Our Jindal lecturer for today, whom it's my great honor to introduce, is David Moss, Professor of Social Anthropology at the School of Oriental and African Studies, SOAS, in London, where I had the good fortune of doing a master's many years ago. Uh, Professor Moss, or David, if I may, studied social anthropology at Oxford University, where he received his DPhil. David is often described as possibly the leading anthropologist of development, but this form of praise doesn't still quite ca capture the specificity of what he does and the reason why so many of us here in anthropology, in sociology, in political science, read and teach his work. So as a way to kick off the conversation, I just wanted to give you a few lines of context about the kind of the real uniqueness of David's work. A lot of anthropologists who write on development, and many of us will be familiar with this, find themselves sometimes implicitly, sometimes explicitly, taking a position of moral or political or epistemological superiority over development practitioners and international institutions. The critiques are often easier because the critics themselves haven't actually been part of that world or any world of policy making and experienced its threats and possibilities from within. David has been a part of such worlds for impressively long stretches of time. From 1985 to 1987, he worked for the UK Overseas Development Administration overseeing projects in Tanzania and Bangladesh. From 1987 to 1991, he was the Oxfam representative for South India in Bangalore in India with the responsibility for policy and program implementation for Oxfam in the three Indian states of Karnataka, Tamil Nadu and Kerala. In 91, David joined the Center for Development Studies at the University of Wales, after which he joined SOAS, where he is now, in 1997. While continuing development consultancy work, David has had an astonishing published publication record. But rather than giving you a kind of list of publications, I'll mention just two books of his that I have taught myself and learned a lot from, as many of us have here at Watson. His two best known books, maybe his 2005 book, Cultivating Development, is quite unique in the meticulous longitudinal way in which it follows a DFID project over more than a 10-year period through policy boardrooms, government offices, and Bheel tribal villages. Nothing changes that dramatically, but the project goes being, from being declared a success to being declared a failure. And David shows us how this happens in the process giving us the instability of such measures. David's most recent book, The Saint in the Banyan Tree, Christianity and Caste Society in India, published by UC Berkeley Press in 2012, is a kind of a breakthrough work on caste in as much as it reminds us that caste is not only a Hindu phenomena, and in fact, outside of Hinduism, groups have to confront caste-based discrimination without any of the welfare benefits and state protection in as much as these are at least potentially available to some people. In today's Jindal lectures, we'll hopefully get to know more about David's current research, although to my own disappointment, he won't be talking about one of the strands of his current research that interests me and excites me a lot, which is in collaboration with a psychiatrist in London on caste and mental health. 
Among his other engagements, just to mention, David is also is a fellow of the British Academy, elected in 2013. He's on the editorial boards of World Development, American Ethnologist, and Journal of Development Studies. And he's on the governing body of SOAS, a task that he began in September 2013. Before we go further, I wanted to also share one difficult piece of news, which makes today's lecture all the more inspiring. Uh, many of you probably heard about the tragic events in Manhattan yesterday when a 29-year-old man in a rental truck killed eight pedestrians. Uh, one of the eight victims, as it happens, is uh, Professor Moss's nephew. David will be leaving for New York soon, but he asked us to go ahead with the lecture as scheduled. So on behalf of all of us here, I hope that you'll join me in expressing our deepest condolences to David and to his family and to express our collective admiration at David's fortitude in staying with us and for continuing even in this terribly difficult moment. And as we would in India, I hope it's OK if you'll join me in a moment of silence in mourning and to express our solidarity for David's family and for the victims of this tragedy. Thank you, David, for being with us. Uh, <clears throat> Just to briefly complete my introduction, so it's also become a tradition in the Jinda lectures to have discussants who kind of enliven and receive and respond to our lecturers' thoughts. And in the spirit of David's writings, we might say that we do this to make it a more dialogic process rather than a top-down lecture. So very briefly to introduce our two discussants today, Bhavani, Bhavani Baswala, completed his PhD in anthropology at Brown in 2016. In 2016-17, Bhavani was the Singh postdoctoral associate in the South Asian Studies Council and the Anthropology Department at Yale University. His principal research interests include questions of social inequality, caste, development, urbanization, urban poverty, discrimination, language, and citizenship. He explores these questions in Rajasthan and Delhi through extensive ethnographic work on informal labor, spatial politics, food, everyday lived experience, informal settlements, and intercommunity relations. Before coming to the US, Bhavani completed an MPhil in sociology as well as an MA in international politics from the famous and now famously embattled bastion of critical or left thought in India, uh, JNU or Jawaharlal Nehru University. And along with Bhavani, lastly, it gives me great pleasure to introduce my colleague and friend, Professor Sarah Besky, Assistant Professor of Anthropology and Director of Undergraduate Studies here at the Center for Contemporary South Asia at the Watson Institute. Sarah teaches what might be among the largest classes in the humanistic social sciences, at least, here at Brown, with over 200 students in her class this semester, Global Social Problems. And her class had the good fortune of meeting David earlier today. Uh, Sarah received her PhD in anthropology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. From 2012 to 2015, uh, she was a postdoctoral fellow in the Society of Fellows at the University of Michigan. Her first book, The Darjeeling Distinction, Labor and Justice on Fair Trade Tea Plantations in India, published by University of California Press in 2014, uh, won the Society for Economic Anthropology Book Prize in 2015. Her second book, which she is currently working on, uh, blends historical and ethnographic research on science, value, and the idea of quality in the tea industry to ask what economic reform means in India, not just in terms of rhetoric or periodization, but in relation to particular trajectories of labor, commodity, and value. So we'll, with that, begin with David's 
lecture and then move straight into the comments by Bhavani and then set up. So thank you again and welcome David. We are so happy that you're here. Thank you. Thank you, Brigu, for that very warm welcome. Uh, thank you for your sensitive invocation of a larger family that is shared uh, in, this, uh, in this, this, the grief of the particular moment. And uh, thanks to the Watson Institute and, of course, to the um, uh, Jindal Lecture um, hosts and uh, patrons. It's a great honor and a privilege to, to be here. I'm just move some of this out of the way. A few, years, a few years ago, I began a collaborative project which I titled Cast Out of Development. Apart from the obvious reference to a kind of social exclusion, this was intended to reference what I observed as the discursive exclusion of caste from policy framing in international development. In contrast to attention paid to, say, gender or age, relationships of caste seem absent from frameworks of poverty and sector analysis. So caste, so ubiquitous an aspect of socioeconomic life finds little place in mainstream development thinking. Of course, since independence, Indian law has offered protection against caste discrimination and introduced affirmative action and a plethora of targeted programs for particular sections of society. But caste does not much feature as a relational phenomena. That's to say, as a continuing structural cause of inequality or impoverishment in present-day market-led development. Certainly not as might be subject to international policy debate. Indeed, when talking with Indian expatriate staff, Indian or expatriate staff at the World Bank or the UN or aid agencies in Delhi in 2011-12, I was struck by the marked nervousness surrounding the issue of caste. Among bureaucrats and NGO workers, the degree of openness to the topic was often a reflection of caste identity, uh, the caste identity of my interlocutors. The underlying message is that caste is an internal matter, unique both in form and solution to India as a post-colonial nation. And the Indian government has ensured that it does not have monitored accountability to UN treaty bodies for its record on caste inequality or discrimination as a matter of human rights. For not unrelated reasons, the introduction of caste into anti-discrimination law outside uh, India is controversial, as in the UK, where this is currently being vigorously opposed by Hindu bodies with ties to organizations allied to the ruling BJP. My argument in the first part of the lecture, and the structure is broadly up there so you can keep track, is that caste fails to be a matter for development in the broad sense of planning for progressive change in economy and society because public policy discourse quarantines caste as outside the realm of the modern present. I'll suggest this happens in two ways. First, caste is framed as an archaic social and ritual order, erased by economic modernity. Second, caste enters public debate as a domain of special measures, affirmative action, and reservations, as a particular kind of caste politics. Set aside as religion or culture or dismissed as reservations politics, caste is reproduced largely unobserved in the informal relations of the economy. My second argument is that it's not only in public policy that caste is regarded uh, so uh, in this way, but also in village life. And I'll turn briefly to a Tamil village I'm familiar with to make the point that while disappearing as ritual order and peripheral to village life as identity politics, caste has particular importance as an opportunity generating resource. But the shift entailed from caste as honor to caste as opportunity decreases its visibility. In the nation and in the village, there appears to be a disjuncture between the public narrative of caste as tradition and identity politics and the processes of caste which are firmly part of the modern economy. It's these processes that are the focus of the third part of the lecture, which turns to a body of research making visible what is socially concealed about caste in the economy. I conclude with thoughts about the kind of idea of modern caste that might be fruitful in the light of this evidence. One final introductory remark. The framing of caste today is crucially a matter of social location. In a brilliant essay, One Step Outside Modernity on Caste and the Public Sphere, the late MSS Pandian drew attention to the sharply divided discourse on caste. 
the upper caste silence on caste counterpoised to the politics of difference in the lower caste struggles. He pointed to how the language of caste is delegitimized in the modern public domain, including development, annexed as the religious or cultural inner domain, or the non-modern, uh, and, and by extension, how caste politics is the non-modern to the market economy. He goes on to say, quote, the Indian modern, despite its claim to be universal, and indeed because of it, not only contributes, constitutes lower castes as its other, but also inscribes itself silently as upper caste. Thus, caste as the other of the modern always belongs to the lower castes. The challenge of sustaining attention to caste in modernity and economy in the universal discourses of planning, economics, and human rights focused on unequal relations rather than religion and culture or even politics, a challenge inaugurated most obviously by Dr. B.R. Ambedkar, is, of course, also refusal to align the experience of discrimination to the condition of underdevelopment and caste itself as an attribute of subalterns. Caste in policy, the two framings. In post-independent India, there was a marked reluctance to use caste to explain poverty and inequality. As Christoph Jaffrelo points out, the, quote, resolutely modernist attitude that permeated planning in Nehru's government combined a rejection of colonial caste-based classifications threatening the unity of the new nation, Marxist class universalism, and Gandhian utopianism, and anticipated that, quote, Social and other distinctions will disappear as we advance towards the goal of socialist, a socialist society, as Home Minister G.B. Pant put it, in rejecting the use of caste in the 1953 First Backward Classes Commission. Caste was an archaic institution weakened by modern market forces that were as incompatible with caste continuity as Marx considered the colonial railways to be. The exception to the policy of exclusion of caste concerning, cons uh, concerned the former untouchables, today's Dalits. Indeed, caste entered modern public policy debate through provisions for those whose backwardness was seen as arising from historical Hindu practices of untouchability, a notion still without definition or test, now compensated by provisions of the Constitution and the protections afforded to them as scheduled castes, a category defined in religious terms so as to exclude Dalits of Muslim or Christian affiliation. In treating Dalits as essentially religious subjects and enclaving caste as a matter of religion, separate from political economy, the Indian state inherited categorizations which Rupa Vishwanath, in her recent book, The Pariah Problem, explains as rooted in Protestant missionary engagement with Dalits in the late 19th century. A chain of events and reactions led a Dalit condition of enslavement to be spiritualized, rendering untouchability religious and missionaries to be opposed as a threat to Hindu religion rather than as a challenge to landlord abuse of Dalit labor, and led Gandhi to insist on Hindu religious reform and penitence that is change within as the route to the emancipation of the untouchables, the British governing principle of religious non-interference having already closed off caste practice from state intervention. When Dalits did gain citizen rights to former, uh, formerly barred public spaces, such as temples or water sources, by which time untouchability had been secularized as civic exclusion through colonial ideas of public access, and when Dalit representatives in the Madras Legislative Council raised objection to continued caste exclusion, Vishwanath argues, the government treated this as a matter of the social realm, something regarded as self-regulating and properly subject to gradual reform from within, of the kind Gandhi advocated, rather than the infringement of socio-political rights requiring legal or state intervention as Ambedkar proposed. The point I take from this is that, missionary and, uh, is that missionary and colonial policy, which disembedded religion from economics and separated the social from the properly governmental, put in place a modern structure of categories that still works to remove caste from the realm of mainstream development policy. We see this, for example, in the way that colonial labor policy was separated from policy on the depressed classes, the Dalits. But also, by how in modern social policy, caste, as it affects the conditions of Dalits, is construed not as a matter of political economy, but is addressed as a specific social disability, 
that is, as a static residual problem addressed through remedial protections, safeguards, complaint handling for marginal groups, so that they may, in the rubric, overcome their social and economic handicaps and, quote, catch up with the rest of the population. Caste is not a dynamic relational problem critical to the ongoing equalizing processes or unequalizing processes within that population, even though the key ministry and commission responsible derive their mandate from the Constitution's fundamental rights on equality. In other words, while a socially disabled group is, subject, uh, is the subject of policy and intervention, caste as a socioeconomic process is not. Everyday caste is a matter of society, not of government. It lies behind the veil of law. Or put another way, the conditions of Dalits are addressed as claims or demands on the government for services, education, or proportional development budgets framed in terms of special measures, affirmative action, rather than in terms of the state's general duty to address inequality and discrimination in economy and society. Moreover, these special measures and schedules fix Dalit identity in relation to lineage and historical injustice rather than present aspiration and preclude transformation of that burdened identity, for example, by religious conversion. Relations of caste only come into view of the law when exceptionalized in the criminal juridical category of caste atrocities, specified wrongs with individual perpetrators. Everyday relations of caste are a matter of social and especially now neoliberal market self-transformation. They will be irrelevant or may, they will be made irrelevant by development and the significance of caste in entrenching inequality is lost in a culturalization of caste and an economization of poverty. And as a matter of Indian religion and culture, caste is no matter for international agencies whose concern with poverty or social exclusion is anyway overwritten in the new development relationship with India focused on trade and private sector business. If caste excludes mainstream development policy and planning because first enclosed within religion and culture, it has more recently been enclosed within politics. This is the second policy framing that I turn to. The second backward caste or Mandal Commission, extending reservations to a diverse collection of other backward classes, brought in the hitherto rejected idea that caste could be used as a criterion for socioeconomic backwardness. As the Mandal report put it succinctly, caste is also a class of citizen. But as Christoph Jaffrelo argues, the rationale behind the eventual implementation of Mandal's recommendations was not so much to view caste in socioeconomic terms and to improve the position of caste disadvantaged groups as to empower them politically. We believe, the Prime Minister V.P. Singh announcing the schemes in 1990 said, that no section can be uplifted merely by money. They can develop only if they have a share in power and in the running of the country. Unquote. The violent protest that ensued certainly brought political substance to what began as an abstract administrative category, the OBCs, and electoral success to caste-based parties, a silent revolution, as Jaffrelo calls it, that brought a new legitimacy to caste in the public sphere, to quote him. The story of how Mundell produced a new political category and changed that category's relationship to power is well enough known to this audience. But what is perhaps less observed is the relative autonomy of the transformations of caste in the realm of politics from caste in the economy. Jeff Witso's recent book, Democracy Against Development, shows for Lalu Prasad Yadav's Bihar between 99 and 2005, how OBCs were able to take control of political power and for a while disrupt the upper caste controlled state directed project of development, but were unable to institutionalize this power so as to bring equalizing socioeconomic gains for them. Niraja Jayal goes further to suggest that the extension of public sector reservations and the restriction of the caste issue to them was a form of caste abatement offering political recognition to disadvantaged groups while avoiding economic redistribution 
and serving to contain political discontent surrounding unequal economic opportunity unleashed by the simultaneous but more stealthy introduction of neoliberal reforms, effectively protecting elite class caste interests now re reoriented to private business. Although, of course, political scientists, including Ashutosh Vashni here, remind us that the political rise of a voting lower caste poor created democratic pressure to ensure that the tax revenue from the new wealth in industry was directed to huge increases in state welfare programs, a rhetoric of inclusive growth and enactment of social and economic rights, right to education, to food, and rural employment, a class abatement alongside the caste reservations. As scholars who've turned attention to the upper caste, middle class politics of caste refusal point out, reservations merely provided another ground for denigrating unmodern and moribund caste, and the self-serving political entrepreneurs who give caste its unneeded afterlife. Moreover, by insisting, as their UK counterparts do, that the language of caste is indefensible in public spaces of modernity, caste itself is delegated to the subalterns who become its accused purveyors, as Pandian noted and Ajanta Subramaniam explores in her work on Indian Institutes of Technology. But if this is also a politics of concealed caste advantage, and I'll come to that, it requires that caste be protected as private social fabric. So alongside the denial of caste, Balmurli Nadrajan and others point out is the narrative that what remains of caste is benign or beneficial. Caste is community or cultural identity, part of the vitality of Indian democracy. Caste provides networks of trust for business. Caste is anyway a private and domest domestic matter. The caste-based atrocities that reach TV screens and newspapers represent an abnormality of normally benign caste. In brief, I'm suggesting that whether premised on compensation for religious and civic disability, or on political mobilization, or the discourse of, on reservations, or the rejection of that discourse in the name of merit and modernity, public policy discourse directs attention away from the vitality and social effects of caste in the post-reform Indian economy. Caste in the village. As a prelude to the study of caste out of development, I visited the Tamil village, which I call Alapuram, in which three decades earlier, I first tried to make sense of caste. I can't possibly explain the complex transformations of caste as I've tried to in my book, The Saint in the Banyan Tree, mentioned by Brigu. But what struck me here was a parallel representation of caste as ritual order and identity politics, veiling its structural effects on economic opportunity. While it's never been possible for this village to describe the varied identities and social relations as anything like a caste system, the idea of an archaic caste order has always been present as a kind of public representation. Everyday negotiations of labor relations and especially challenges to collective caste power have been made in the idiom of this ceremonial order. Its symbols, spaces, rituals, and exchanges, such as when Dalits grab the festival statues, enter the village temples and tea shops, or change the meaning, the social meaning of work, by replacing caste referencing grain transactions with the market idiom of negotiated rates and cash payments. Since, as Alapuram Dalit, the Alapuram Dalit Dobi said to me in 1983, work paid for in cash has no pollution. The point is that today, the old order of caste is firmly located in the uncouth, enslaved past. By a common moral narrative of the growth of civility, the language of distinction and rank is rarely heard in public, partly owing to it being subject to criminal cases, although a persisting inner caste state of mind is often suspected. Across the country, Research reports such leveling of the markers of social recognition, whether food, dress, grooming, styles of worship, and a, quote, declining ability of others to impose social inequalities, as Kapoor et al. conclude from a large-scale two-block study of Dalits in Uttar Pradesh. But we should be more cautious than these authors are in reading changed public codes of behavior as signs of market-driven social transformation. For one thing, Dalits in Alapuram would tend to see a caste order not undermined by the market, 
but defeated by their own political struggle. For another, achieved inequality also produces inequality. The collective action of the puller caste elite may have made it utterly irrelevant who carries the statues, who enters the tea shop, bicycles in the main street, but class inequality widens and a categorical separation of the poorer paria caste remains. And Dalit men not infrequently escaped dishonor by displacing ignominious tasks needed to keep patrons onto their womenfolk. Nonetheless, ranked caste order has faded from village public life. But paradoxically, caste is more visible than ever. As you climb down from a bus at the roadside commercial center of the village, you'll be confronted by clusters of flags, banners, posters, signaling a proliferation of caste associations, fronts, movements, parties, and NGOs. Competition to occupy public space brings ever larger wedding or puberty ceremony banners and statues of caste heroes, ancient and modern, erected in village squares, signals group identity and connections. However, despite appearances, caste is not reborn within the village in the communalized form that characterizes district or state level politics, its rallies, its guru pujas, and street clashes. A disjuncture between communal caste politics and the quotidian village is maintained by skilled political entrepreneurs who intertranslate between the two in ways I've not time to explain. Simplifying a point, one could say that in the village, as in the nation, caste recedes as archaic rank and honor. And caste politics now has an autonomy from economic life in the village that was not the case in the caste struggles of the 1960s and 70s. But what about caste in the village economy? When Dalit businessman and intellectual Chandraban Prasad says that, quote, capitalism can destroy the caste system from within, he invokes the impact of the post-1990 decline of agriculture and the explosion of non-farm opportunities on caste as an agrarian order. In Alapuram village, the abandonment of cultivable land to wood fuel shrubs, farmers' reliance on crop insurance payments, public distribution rice, or employment scheme wages as much as tilling the land, and the huge diversification of non-farm business within the village, together with work outside, all signal what is a national trend. This has been tracked in longitudinal village studies, none more thorough than the seven-decade Palanpur project in Uttar Pradesh. Its recent reports show that an overall decline in poverty is nonetheless accompanied by an increase in inequality as the poorest depend upon uncertain casual work in railways, cloth mills, bakeries, bottling liquor, brick kilns, or migrating as construction workers. The impact of such change on caste relations is a complex issue. It's true that the Palanpur researchers find most inequality between households and thus within caste, implying that caste is, is unimportant to or being made so by such change. But other studies show that the transition out of farming to industry, reinforcing caste-based debt and dependency. Ethnographic study of the diversifying economy of villages near the Tirupur textile hub in Tamil Nadu by Carswell and Deneuve finds quite opposite effects, both eroding and entrenching caste inequality, even in close by and apparently similar villages. Explaining the different impact of, caste labor market on, of labor markets on caste and caste on labor markets means taking account of many things. Histories of land control or reform, urban proximity, caste demography, and political mobilization. Observing caste effects in the economic life of today's villages is not easy. What struck me as my assistant M. Sivan revisited 60 Alapuram families of different castes to, uh, to ask about the route to work of their sons and daughters was that despite being a receding determinant of standing in the village, caste was important in the structuring of opportunity in the world beyond. Caste was an alloyed effect. Bound up and disguised in the mobilization of capital, dowry payments, networks into institutions of government or the church, caste was now mobilized not as status, but as a resource. 
The banners and posters, the marriage halls, the scholarships and prizes for topper students of regionally linked caste associations were not organizing for village or regional political power so much as networking for access to the regional economy. Of course, the two interlink. To borrow Kirsten Hastrup's distinction, here caste is less substance, that is, ethnicized identity and struggles for political power, and more set. That is looser, intentional, strategic network pragmatically realized in the search for jobs, skills, marriages, and local dispute mediation. It's poverty in this resource of caste, capital, and connections that leaves a large proportion of Dalits in permanent insecurity. Indeed, while their fathers organized for tea shop entry and to carry the festival statues of the saints in, the field, in a field of caste honor, Dalit youth today mobilize around the privileges, chits, and tickets for access to the economy, targeting the gatekeepers of opportunities such as schools, colleges, or the church. My final point from the village is that this shift from honor to opportunity decreases the visibility of caste. Caste reworked as private connections and capital is not easily perceived as such. Among the Alapuram Dalits surveyed, the expectation of equal treatment for example, in schools and colleges, was firm. And in accounting for outcomes, who got jobs and so on, they emphasized personal talent, qualifications, skill, good luck, and God's blessing alongside helpful priests and patrons, even though it was well understood that the route to the good bishop was by way of his caste networked secretary. Despite their own insistence that these are days of civility and equality, the majority of Dalit surveys nonetheless expected ill treatment and disrespect as they sought work or other breaks, and could not imagine escape into the casteless anonymity they desired, or into mere poverty. In fact, poverty itself exposes people to caste humiliation, and our survey showed that the poorest and women were most incentivized by ill treatment to try to conceal their caste when laboring in distant places. Let me turn now from the village to the wider economy. And to a recent body of work by collaborative teams of ethnographers and economists that has indeed begun to map the unquestionably harder to detect modern caste relations. It's become clear that those who controlled the village land gained privileged positions in the regional and industrial economy, and that caste networks into cooperatives, sand mining cartels, in college campuses, companies, and the church are central to how business, bureaucracy, and education work. Those drawn or pushed out of agriculture are sorted into work graded by skill, security, danger, or toxicity in caste-related ways. So, for example, Dalit workers in the Tirupur garment industry are more likely to find themselves in the low-skilled dirty dyeing units and non-Dalits in the skilled tailoring parts. Turning then to caste and the structuring of opportunity, let me look, look in turn at A, the labor market, and B, the business economy. First, caste in the labor market. It's not necessary to deny the experience of individual caste mobility to acknowledge that at the scale of national data sets, as Ashwini Deshpande concludes, the diversification brought by post-reform development has not broken the association across states of upper castes with higher status professions and Dalits with manual and casual labor. The data reveal glass walls against Dalit occupational mobility out of caste type roles or low end service trades into more profitable ones or self employment. And the intersections of caste and gender mean that Dalit women with comparatively higher, although declining, participation rates in the labor force are particularly restricted in job mobility. Three caste effects can be mentioned one, occupational ranking. Two, network effects or opportunity hoarding, three unequal categories. First then, occupational ranking, evidence for the differential valuation of work and workers and the caste typing of jobs is strong in certain businesses such as restaurants with Brahmin cooks and suppliers or sanitary work with Dalit labor. Identity bound work especially characterizes the most stigmatized occupations and none more so than the filthy, dehumanizing and unprotected work of dealing with human excreta, known as manual scavenging, 
campaigned against and prohibited by law, but still assigned to the lowest Dalit castes. Barbara Harris White's recent analysis of the informal waste economy of a Tamil town shows how the social cost of disposal of noxious waste is placed on undervalued humans. And Bedker's point that caste is not just a division of labor, it's a division of laborers, was, however, lost on the World Bank when it concluded its 2011 report on poverty and social exclusion in India with Prasad's over-optimistic words, quote, along with a new tool which neutralizes caste, the sweeper in the mall turns into a housekeeper, looking more like a paramedic than a traditional sweeper. In one stroke, the market has liberated the broom from its caste identity, and the occupation has become caste neutral. Second, workers are sorted through the caste networks of referral-based labor recruitment by gang leaders and foremen that produce caste-segregated labor markets, familiar, for, for instance, in the colonial mills, railways, factories, mines, or plantations, and their modern uh, equivalents. And third, of course, the opportunities opened to an in-group by caste networks also exclude others as a category, as Charles Tilley argues. I was involved in research that found such categorical exclusion on the construction sites of Western India, which distinguished Saurastrian bricklayers from, Dal from Dalit or Beel casual laborers, ensuring that even after 25 years' work on the construction sites in stone quarries, lime kilns, and brick fields, a Dalit or Adivasi laborer had no chance to get skilled or better paid work despite a shortage of skilled labor. And by influencing skill acquisition, such occupational differentiation becomes self-reproducing. For this reason, education is valued as the route to individual mobility out of caste occupational traps and deeply woven into Dalit narratives of new identity and progress. Yet studies across the country point to the shackles of caste labeling, low expectations or classroom segregation that defeat Dalit ambition. Indeed, using national data, a national data set of over 51,000 households, Desai et al. found that while poor educational outcomes among OBCs and scheduled tribes had to do with low enrollment and parents' education or income, in the case of Dalits, caste identity independently affects the impact of schooling. Beyond school, problems for Dalits deepen. Not only did the Dalit upper caste gap in access to higher education widened in the post-reform period to 2004-05, a time when the premium to education rose, but also the return on degree level education for Dalits in terms of pay declined between 83 and 2000. These are in the apt title of Jeffrey et al's ethnography of the disrupted route from college to jobs, Degrees Without Freedom. Indeed, Maitri Das concludes bleakly from the evidence that for urban Dalits, post-primary education, quote, confers almost a disadvantage, bettering the chances of neither salaried work nor self-employment, while increasing their likelihood of opting out of the labor force. Asking why equivalently qualified Dalits earn less points to discrimination, particularly in recruitment and role allocation. Discrimination occurs in, at two levels. First, the job market implicitly demands of applicants traits, skills, linguistic and cultural competences which the education system does not explicitly give and that come from families transmitting a dominant class caste culture bundled as individual merit. The merit strictly used by uh, by in, in recruitment by managers of 25 large Delhi firms interviewed by Surinder Jodka was emphatically, quote, formed within the crucible of the family. Second, discrimination is direct. Applicants are sorted explicitly by caste and religion. That's what studies using fake CVs signaling the caste or religious identity of identically qualified candidates find, especially in private firms in certain sectors more so in call center than software industry jobs, for instance, and when recruiters are male and Hindu. These caste effects are reproduced through differentiated expectations of graduates, so that upper caste class candidates experience, uh, experience prejudicial norms and networks as casteless merit, whereas Dalit men and women experience being identified with their caste background at every turn. 
Perhaps Dalits can skirt discrimination in the primary labor market by turning to self-employment. Surely the massive post-reform two-thirds increase in private business since 1990, with half the workforce self-employed by 2005, provides the conditions for the erasure of caste. The prominence of caste in business, however, suggests otherwise. Again, in business, we, we find the influence of, one, caste networks, two, a ranking of markets, and three, exclusion. The importance of networks is well known from the way castes dominant in 19th century trade moved into manufacturing followed post-1991 by agricultural castes. Caste networks for business regulation are especially important where risks are high, formal institutions weak, and selective trust at a premium. Whether the low-end, high-turnover, opportunistic Gujarat garment industry studied by Harris or the high-end diamond industry in Mumbai and Antwerp studied by Munshi. Strong caste networks also develop in shunned markets, such as leather and sanitation wear, and in the waste economy. For example, in Delhi, where Kaveri Gill shows that caste, how caste divisions here among Dalits differentiate between those dealing in segregated inorganic waste, often plastic, and the stigmatized Dalit caste picking and dealing in unsegregated part organic material. The more inferiorized the market, the more closely caste linked to occupational pasts. Correspondingly, Dalit business access to markets is differentiated. Sectors such as mining or quarrying, construction and transport are found to be relatively open to Dalits. While entry into, into health and education, food, hospitality and the service sector is much harder. Restricted access to capital or collateral especially property undervalued because of its caste location. Access to premises, infrastructure, raw materials, and markets means that Dalits, the first generation to do so, have entered the business economy at the bottom, running petty shops or working as dealers or agents. The still disproportionately small Dalit share of, the ent of enterprise ownership initially decreased post-reforms before rising to two, uh, by 2005, and Ashutosh has uh, written on this. Asim Prakash's study of 90 cases opens a window on Dalit entrepreneurs' experience of the liberalized economy. He reveals the business costs of exclusion from networks that facilitate the informal transactions with officials needed for business that are hardly compensated by their own Dalit Chamber of Commerce, whose aspiration is to fight caste with capitalism, or by reliance on NGOs, or state experiments to diversify government procurement, such as Madhya Pradesh's, in line with the pro-Dalit 2002 Bhopal Declaration. Dalits feel closed in by humiliating prejudice. One in Uttar Pradesh tells Surinder Jodhka, quote, while other businesses are known by the services they provide or the goods they sell, our shops are known by our caste names. Many try to hide their caste, half in Jodhka's study, especially where rivals leverage caste against them. As a Dalit woman supplying lunch boxes to Mumbai offices tells Prakash, quote, there used to be a huge demand for the food I prepared. However, when the popularity of my food affected the business interests of Mandraka, an upper caste, he went and told everybody that I belonged to a low caste. Thereafter, the demand for my food reduced by more than half. This is also found in health and education related business to an extent that suggests to Harris White an attitude that Dalits are expected to be laborers and their entry into business is socially transgressive. Interestingly, discrimination is even uneven across the country. In fact, Harris White et al. map three regional variants. A northern belt with low general business activity and low Dalit participation. A central belt with high activity and high Dalit participation and a southern belt with high business activity but low Dalit participation. State policy, such as on poverty reduction, is a poor explainer of this variation, but so too are education levels, urbanization, growth rates, Dalit political success, or anti-caste movements, especially of the southern entrepreneurial region having strong discrimination against Dalit business. Barriers to self-employment lead many Dalits to withdraw into unemployment, some becoming part of what James Ferguson refers to as the not working poor. 
in the jobless city, in which people survive not through productive work, that's proper jobs, but through processes of distribution, that is gaining or claiming a share of other people's resource or income streams, itself highly dependent on kin and caste networks. So what can we conclude about caste in the post-liberalization economy? Certainly, caste does not denote a single process or effect. As Harris White puts it, to quote, caste has a perplexing capacity to dissolve as ascriptive characteristics give way to acquired ones, such as skills, compliance, and trust, experience and creative competences, and as capital becomes mobile. But at the same time, it persists and transforms itself as a regulative structure of the economy, sometimes in the same place. And as such, caste works both as a structure of advantage, a social structure of accumulation, in Harris White's phrase, and as a structure of disadvantage or discrimination. The effects of caste are such as to operate quite differently, often inversely, on upper castes and Dalits. We should be clear, modern caste persists in the age of the market because of its advantages. Its discriminations are opportunities for others, but it's rarely examined as such. Indeed, constitutionally and legally, caste is only a source of disadvantage, never a source of privilege. But as in the village, caste is a resource perhaps best conceived of as a network of potential or actual kin, a network with enormous durability and spatial reach, offering protection, social insurance, access to jobs, business, and the state, a control over resources beyond state regulation, as economists such as Munshi have pointed out. The value of caste belonging is attested by the low and stable rate of outmarriage at just 5% in rural India, and that still 70% of educated middle-class Indians marry within caste. The mutual insurance in crisis provided by Jati networks at village level is well understood, and their role in links to labor markets and for business has been noted. At the same time, networks have their own effects. For example, Munchi and Rosenweig argue that the costs of exiting village caste networks explain India's relatively low rural to urban migration, despite high wage differentials. Changed circumstances can alter, even reverse, the positive effect of a network. Munchi and Rosenzweig again explain how caste networks that facilitated the mobility of one generation of Dalit men from villages into formal sector blue-collar uh, blue jobs in Mumbai limited the opportunity of the next as boys were channeled into network-linked vernacular, uh, vernacular language schools, excluding them from the new white-collar jobs in the post-liberalization economy, accessed in fact by young women, their sisters and relatives, through high return English medium education. The idea that Dalits are actually disadvantaged by their networks is supported by Deshpande's recent finding in Delhi that upper caste secondary school graduates who used networks in job searches did better than those who did not, but Dalit graduates using caste networks did worse than those who did not. In principle, caste networks that fail to meet interest will decay. But in practice, political, the political construction of interests, including oppositional identity struggles, holds networks together when they no longer improve economic welfare. Or as Craig Jeffrey um, and et al. show, network building by educated Dalits here in rural Uttar Pradesh is a response to blocked access to jobs or business. But Dalit networks that are strong politically are often weak in terms of the informal processes that garner access to markets, capital, and jobs, according to, to quote Maitri Das. Indeed, the great scope and influence of caste lies in the fact that, as Harris White points out, the part of the Indian economy upon which the vast majority of people depend is informal, regulated not by legal institutional structures of the state, but through social structures of gender, religion, and caste, which extend their influence to the operation of formal institutions and the market, controlling the supply and price of goods, rents, and labor in ways that, quote, remain hardly touched by liberalization. The, pre the predominant importance of informal processes is, is one reason, as well as time, that I've not said much about affirmative action, even though, as mentioned, 
the issue of reservations has come to dominate national discourse and, po and, and uh, political action on caste. It's certainly significant that the anxieties about success in the new post-reform economic order should focus on caste reservations, activism both against reservations and to extend them, the latter legally unsuccessful claim uh, being for OBC status from dominant farming caste, Jats, Patels, Marathas, um, th threatened, for example, by corporatization of agriculture or water scarcity and drought or being outcompeted uh, for jobs. But given my argument here, the reservations debate is significant as much for what it detracts attention from, namely the centrality of caste in informal structures of economy, as in itself. Certainly the evidence for ongoing unequal opportunity and market and non-market based discrimination is strong and so the justification for reservations holds. Arguments for their ineffectiveness on grounds such as poor outcomes, creamy layer benefits or inefficiency are not supported empirically. Reservations do distribute opportunity, hence upper caste resentment, although their impact on na narrowing the gap between Dalits and others may only be to moderate inequalities, especially in relation to higher education and the most prestigious jobs. The notion that reservations perpetuate caste speaks more powerfully of the invisibility guaranteed to processes of caste in accumulation in ordinary, mostly informal, economic life. What is visible is the outrage that competition from below can provoke. That is the increasing scale of humiliating violence against Dalits, nowadays um, uploaded often onto social media. Attacks that are shown by Sharma, using a decade's crime data from 2001 to 10, to correlate with the narrowing gap between the standard of living of dominant castes and Dalits. So caste, network, and identity. I said I'd end with comment on what kind of idea of modern caste would be helpful, given that established models and newer ones emphasizing identity seem not to be. Considering the range of interactional domains in which caste is reproduced, networks would not be a bad place to start. Network analysis would avoid caste as an overdetermined, totalizing cultural and political concept, or presume an independently definable caste logic which is no longer productive. Caste is seen to break down and reform in new ways. Caste-influenced interactions produce genuinely new, new and unexpected forms, perhaps interacting with other networked processes around forms of consumption, taste, style, which socially include and exclude in their own right. Thus, caste influences and multiplies network processes well beyond the fields where it appears within actors' own frames of reference. And it's this flexibility of caste, not continuity of a particular cultural form or social institution, in which lies the resilience of caste. But a network approach, much advantageous though it is, would also have its problems. A relational approach focused on interactional fields cannot grasp the larger system level effects that economic data point to. Caste inequality across different variables that is not lessened in wealthier or fast growing states. A strictly anti-categorical structural approach with nodes only a function of interactions also ignores the importance of circulating cultural and political discourses of caste. Although it's true that integrating into networks is often the means to participate, to participate in identity discourse, accounting, for example, for how on university campuses students only become aware of the salience of their caste as valued or degraded identity by virtue of the networks they are, they are enrolled into or excluded from. Network ideas also strip out power, which is clearly critical to the caste networks mentioned. Power is the unevenly distributed capacity to connect, manifest historically both in the regional networks of dominant castes, enhanced through processes of honor or purity, but also asserted over others, especially Dalits, through restriction on their capacity to connect or to act collectively, or, or used to, quote, pulverize and atomize others through threat of violence and inhibit the formation of positive identity. Finally, one cannot think about the diverse network effects of caste and retain an unexamined notion of caste identity as taken for granted and substantial. 
There is a double challenge here. On the one hand, caste identity is produced interactively, in relation, is relational, and exists in the crossing between networks. Identity as a site of struggle for control to secure a footing or stabilize uncertainty through relationality, as network theorist Harrison White argues. On the other hand, caste is an imposed societal categorization, constituting subjectivities and self-worth experienced, for example, when Dalits in a national sample are found to perceive lower levels of earning as remunerative than others. But we also know from Hoff and Pandey's widely cited experimental studies how making caste salient, for example, publicly announced identities before a problem-solving task, negatively affects Dalit students' performance, the, stereo the stereotype threat effect. That's to say, caste identity is not fixed, but frame-dependent or context-dependent in its effects. The modern power over Dalits is the making salient of caste and all its social judgments, something without consequence for upper castes, which when it happens amidst the expectation of equal treatment, for example, in a college or university, is experienced as shocking, humiliating, even traumatic. Such dignity humiliation, that's the refusal of claims to equality, we found in collaborative research led by Shushrut Jadav is a source of distress, turning universities into places of defeat for ambitious stu uh, Dalit students or faculty. This has a bearing on the tragic death by suicide of talented students in elite institutions, which has been a rupture in the narrative of casteless modernity. To conclude, is caste a development issue? Perhaps this is the wrong question, or only part of the wider question, is caste a modern problem? Yes, it is modern. Is it a problem? That depends on who you ask. Caste helps winners get ahead and sorely burdens others. But, uh, but so does the way of talking or not talking about caste, enclosing caste in religion and in politics. In parallel, caste was placed in the domain of anthropology, to the side of disciplines influencing mainstream development planning. It took two decades for anthropology itself to overcome Louis Dumont's Brahmanic ontological separation of religion and politics, and it has scarcely begun to explore caste in the structuring of the modern economy. It's more often economists who have, in method and object, made caste a modern subject of inquiry. And it's from this body of work that we might find leads for a conceptualization better suited to grasp complex, caste-networked social and economic life. For Dalits, the profound problem of caste is amplified by its denial and by the continuing disjuncture between the public narration of caste as outside the realm of the modern and development and the processes of caste which are firmly part of the modern. Many aspects of the operation of caste beyond ritual order, family and politics are still hardly subject to public discussion. In consequence, to end, as MSS Pandian put it, quote, it's not the words of dialogue in the public, but moments of despair in the private that the Indian modern offers the lowest castes. It demands and enforces that caste can live only secret lives outside the public sphere. Thank you. Thank you, David, for a wonderful lecture. And uh, I think I'll just start my comment with a wish. And the wish is that I had, I, I wish I had read this paper and uh, 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 your, uh, uh, attended your talk when I was doing my field work in 2011. Uh, when I was doing field work, I think there was so much which was going on which I could not make sense of. And I think you're just reading your, uh, just um, reading your uh, lecture and attending your lecture and just uh, listening to you talk about so many processes. In retrospect, uh, so many things uh, have started making uh, uh, more sense to me. So I think in the Bordian term, Bordian term, I think uh, I I can just say that I got the feel for the game after reading your uh, after um, after your talk. 
the, the one way which uh, I think I really found uh, your talk very uh, helpful was to come out of those dichotomous thinking of cultural logic as well as uh, uh, thinking of about uh, 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 caste, poli uh, caste as a politics and caste as, uh, as, uh, as cultural uh, 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 politics. Especially when we talk about identity politics, and I often find that uh, many times the, dis the debates about identity politics often do not uh, link to the everyday experience in that sense. And when you bring economic and experience in that, uh, to some, in some way, that uh, I think the autonomy of identity politics as if uh, the substantialization of caste and they're competing with each other, uh, does uh, uh, linking it to the everydayness uh, uh, makes more sense. And so far, I think my understanding of caste, and I think have been, uh, was ca caste as a cultural logic. Uh, but, uh, that's the uh, I think about uh, purity and pollution. Caste as uh, 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 cultural, caste as identity politics, and caste as uh, theorized from the experience of uh, Dalits. So those are were the three. And I think you just providing a new kind of understanding where you theorize from a caste as, as a social inequality conceptualized through economic conce conceptualization, and that to economy. Uh, conce conceptualization from the informal economy, which constitute about, uh, I, I mean, if my guess is not wrong, that about 90% of the employment and perhaps around close to 50% of non-farm uh, GDP. Uh, so just to have that kind of understanding from uh, uh, d development of caste from that uh, economic pers uh, 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 ec economic side is really helpful uh, to just put other things into the perspective. Also, th this is also, I think, you provide a very critical stance about uh, uh, not to celebrate uh, the market logic and how it ha I, how how does it help uh, uh, d uh, dilute or I think uh, uh, how does the caste die its uh, natural death through market logic because you do provide a more critical understanding of that so that's why I think after uh, your uh, lecture it becomes interesting to just uh, uh, rethink about those ideas about Dalit uh, uh, millionaire or Dalit capitalism those kind of ideas ideas do get. Uh, uh, so th this is a fresh theorization of caste. And I think the, my rest of my comment would be just to, uh, I think would be coming up from a position of inertia. And my inertia is that my conceptualization of caste so far have been through the cultural logic, through the caste as identity politics, and caste as a, uh, a theorized from the experience. And this is from the, so the rest of the comment would be from just, just to have that kind of, uh, how, what does it mean to uh, think about caste through the, uh, 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 from the economic perspective. In your two framing, you talk about in the first framing when the caste uh, is reduced as a social disability and not as a kind of a, the socioeconomic issues being rendered as social disability, civic disability. And in the second framing, you just say that caste identity, what it does is that it empowers people, but it does not lead to economic gain. And you just cite the, uh, the case of Lalu Prasad Yadav that they got uh, then the caste, uh, the caste politics and identity politics they did help them come out of uh, uh, to come to power, but that did not translate into uh, the economic development of the people. I was just thinking about these two things, and, um, and you say that both these framing uh, takes the caste away from the development thing. It's, uh, it does not uh, uh, cast as, uh, the development as economic benefit when we understand this thing. Both this framing takes, uh, takes ca uh, the caste away from the uh, 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 development uh, policy thinking. But when we think about identity politics especially, and in your first framing, when you talk about how during the colonial uh, rules as well as the modern uh, conceptualization of India, caste as a socioeconomic thing was reduced to caste as a civic disability. But exactly this is what uh, identity politics does, that it remakes the caste as a, uh, expands caste as just mere civic uh, disability or, or uh, as a kind of residue to make it as a socioeconomic thing, and not just socioeconomic thing, as a socio-religious thing. So all the discourse about identity politics, when you talk, when you criti criticize Brahmanwa, the Manuwa, the Brahmanism, all, all, all these things. So at the discourse level, at least, those issues which the first framing exclude have been brought central to the point. I agree to the point that uh, this discourse does not translate uh, exactly, for instance, in the case of uh, Bihar, into the economic empowerment. But at least at the discursive level, the second framing, which is the identity politics, make uh, social, uh, make caste as a socio-economic socio issue as well as caste as a socio-religious issue. That then it uh, it links them in in that way. So I was just wondering. What you think when you uh, what, uh, just thinking through more about when you said that uh, identity politics takes that away from the development, take caste as a kind of uh, 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 away from the development thinking. 
Also about, I think, your great uh, analysis about how discrimination is so central in the informal economy. And when we talk about discrimination, I was just thinking about, I think, what kind of, uh, what kind of political action or ideas, uh, uh, I think, uh, what kind of development policy will help us uh, uh, come out of the idea where the leather work, you know, the manual scavenging, all, all, all this thing in that economic field is constituted through that. So in certain ways, all these ideas, when we talk about all the informal, uh, in the informal economy and different kind of occupation and discrimination, the cultural logic again becomes central to that in some ways. For instance, uh, 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 butcher work, uh, uh, manual scavenging, all, 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 the, all this thing. And when they reproduce, I think this uh, discrimination, relations of discrimination are reproduced, the cultural logic is also re being reproduced. So though we're analyzing it in the sense of, uh, only in, in terms of the economic discrimination, but that discrimination uh, 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 practices also reproducing uh, uh, the cultural logic in itself. So what does it then mean to say that we have moved from uh, uh, caste as an honor to caste as an opportunity, caste as an honor to caste as a resource in that sense. And uh, when we see that archaic order is, is receding or has gone down, uh, however, when we just see the, 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 the very detailed analysis of the economy, which informal economy, which you say, and there are lots of the different dimensions of relation and all different dimensions of uh, discrimination, all the, the discrimination can be related to some extent. For instance, the, main, the, the various examples which you, again, to the, the caste logic. So, so do we, how do we then build economics in relation to that cultural logic? Uh, you also talk about, uh, 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 in, in your, uh, like for instance, in um, Alapuram, the caste changes the uh, caste changes as caste uh, from honor to caste as uh, resources. So how did that that happen? And I think one of your interlocutors in uh, Alapuram was saying that uh, they struggled for it, the education struggled, and all 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 all, all these things. So it seems that one possible way to reconstitute in that informal economy how these occupations, which are stigmatizedly constituted, is through a political action. Uh, which happened in case of Alapuram when you say when your interlocutors were saying that they reconstituted this thing. That's why they now, at least in the language, if not in reality, they can have a, a discourse of civility, equality. Uh, so that is through that struggle. So in that sense, what I'm just trying to understand again through your, uh, I think, the differentiation between identity politics, cultural logic, and uh, development understood as economic uh, inequality is that how do we relate politics to that? So it seems from your account from um, uh, Alapuram that politics is very central to that. And politics that is based on uh, uh, um, uh, critique of a caste ideology in a certain way. So uh, caste ideology, uh, uh, so I, I was just wondering, so again, I think your economic uh, economic sphere and economic, uh, analysis of economic discrimination in the economic sphere get intensely linked to the identity politics. And I think, so I think that was the another relation so what we were talking about. Also about, um, uh, again, uh, is reservation, uh, are, the discourse of reservation is so important. I think in two, uh, twice you mentioned about reservation. First, uh, uh, how, how much, uh, how, how much is res reservation important when we talk about informal economy? Okay. Uh, so how much do we talk about uh, informal economy, especially vis-a-vis -vis reservation? Uh, so reservation, it depends. I think I agree with you completely that when it reservation, how does reservation gives reservation gives you recognition, all this thing, but how does it translate into the economic opportunities? Uh, the scale of reservation, especially in the public sector units, is so small that I, I, in terms of the economic, it does not make much sense. Yet when we, when I'm just thinking about how linking reservation to the informal economy and to the cultural politics, that uh, I think one of my Dalit interlocutors was telling me this thing about Barbara Harris White's book, uh, that in preface she said that she was talking about uh, Indian uh, economy in the, the class term and talking to some Dalit and Adivasi students. Uh, then she come to the, started talking about Dalit and Adivasi entrepreneurs and the business entrepreneur. So in that sense, what that Dalit inter interlocutor was saying was that reservation and through the, created the spaces where, for instance, the students like him or her can start a dialogue to reformulate the research agenda. So in that sense, if Barbara Harris White talk about Dalit and Adivasi through that conversation with that, that I think he was linking with the reservation. That's the function of reservation, not the economic, directly economic uh, employment immediately after the uh, thing. Just last uh, two, two minutes, yeah. 
the, uh, when we talk about cast as a network analysis, and I think this is fascinating, and I'm still thinking about how to imagine a, po a, po a political possibility through that. The, the cast is, we should not see it cast as a kind of fixed identity, but it is very contextual, it is very uh, fluid in certain ways, it is through interaction. So we're just imagining this question, how do, as, a, as both as a state development policy as, a, as well as activism, how do we it starts, try to conceptualize political action based on that? Because many times it happens that uh, when we talk about fluidity, when we talk about context, uh, the dominant discourses employ the same categories more effectively in denying caste than just uh, realizing caste in that sense. So that's something that, and uh, activist struggle, what would uh, uh, that means that when we talk about not the core substance of the caste, but the but the empirical expression of the caste, and if we had to divide, uh, we, we have to uh, construct our politics based on plurality of the empirical expressions, uh, contextual expression, then what happens to a solid caste, uh, anti-caste uh, 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 agenda uh, uh, in that sense. One last last one. Yeah. So uh, again, uh, just thinking about uh, cultural logic, uh, identity politics, and caste as a network. I think caste as a network. Uh, do though you provide it in terms terms of economic network? I think when you talk about economic uh, equ uh, equality and economic access, I was just wondering uh, in the sense that it makes me think about also realizing the cultural logic and identity politics through the same analysis which you presented in terms of the e economics. For instance, caste when uh, 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 identified as caste as cultural logic that purity in pollution, so that could be a vertical network in that sense. The vertical solidarity can be I think reanalyzed re using your I think framework as a kind of uh, a vertical network and caste as an identity politics can be analyzed as a, uh, a kind of horizontal solidarity and horizontal network. So in that sense, though you use network uh, in a very nuanced way to analyze the economic conditioning, but the same thing can be linked to, just linked together both the cultural logic as well as the identity politi the, uh, politics network. So just, I mean, I think that's where I think I was just thinking about when imagining a po political possibility, both in, I think, state development policy or activism or Dalit activism, for instance, if you can just club them together uh, in that sense so that it's not overdetermined by either cultural logic or identity politics or uh, the, uh, discrimination, which is uh, conceptualized only in the economic term. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Uh, thank you so much um, for letting me respond to this paper. And I want to kind of, I want to start with the, the question, the provocative question, the, the title, right? Is cast a development issue? And it seems that from the paper, and you kind of, you, you end with this in your talk, it's kind of like, well, well, yeah, yeah, cast is a development issue. So then what is, to me, then, the, the question in the paper? Um, you know, I came up with ideas that cast is an accumulation issue, which seems to be uh, where you're going in, particularly towards the end of the paper. It also appears, where you start the paper with, that cast is a discursive issue, or it appears to be sometimes not a discursive issue. And to kind of back that up, I would like to kind of see, maybe a la Ferguson, more of that discursive work. Like, I mean, we kind of are made to go with you on this kind of policy erasure, um, in, or the, this erasure in policy, and policy literature and policy what, um, where that erasure is happening. So it's an accumulation issue, and it's a discursive issue. Or maybe fi finally, foundationally, what the paper is doing is asking, how is cast an issue? Um, and again, I had the opportunity to read the whole paper and as you also heard, it kind of begins uh, with a bit of a conundrum, right? A, a great anthropological conundrum is that, and that is that little policy or even scholarly conception of caste um, as gen um, is, or is, there's a, a, in policy or scholarly conceptions of caste as a generalized mechanism of inequality or discrimination that might be subject to international policy discussion in the way that gender, race, and childhood are. And so, like, how is this a thing? How is this a thing that in the world these concepts um, are held? Um, such that some are protected and some kind of fall through. Like, and I, again, that, that's what makes this, to me, a, a really beautiful piece of anthropology, right? To ask a super foundational question, like, how is this a thing? How is this maintained? How is this uh, perpetuated? And so why is it that caste discrimination, or caste even as a concept, is not being brought meaningfully into these policy discussions? And one answer, of course, is that because such discrimination is thought to be already addressed within India through things like reservations um, for SC groups, for example. And as Moth points out, uh, however, these legal considerations, these formal institutional considerations of caste are largely about expanding democracy, whatever that might mean, rather than about the nuts and bolts of economic development. 
Another reason, perhaps, why caste is so often viewed as a di it, it viewed is that it's a diagnostic. Uh, for inequality or poverty, it ex and that certainly resonates with my own experiences working on plantations. This is poverty exists because of caste, um, but it has no place in development imaginaries or those neoliberal market logics of how to transcend that poverty. Uh, what you know, Moss has described elsewhere as that future perfect of development. Right, caste has no place in that. Um, and perhaps more, most problematically is this notion among elites that development induced social change, that social transcendence in, in all of its forms uh, is post-caste, is in a way beyond caste. Um, and yet both economic opportunity and discrimination do correlate to caste, particularly for Dalits, who largely, however, stand in for caste in, in Moss's paper. Uh, in the heart of this piece, though, I also hear uh, um, one of those questions about the ineffability of the current state of the world, and kind of something as simple as, how can there be caste discrimination? How can there still be caste discrimination? Or why is discrim discrimination not even recognized as such? Or what makes it unrecognizable? And I'll kind of skip um, kind of meditation on network analysis in the interest of time. Um, but I was uh, able to kind of share, uh, while I was reading this, I was kind of talking about this paper uh, with friends who have no, do no work in South Asia. And kind of the, what, what's interesting to me about the piece is you can actually um, substitute in many of your, you know, in, in, in many contexts where you use caste, the word race. Um, you know, to kind of, you know, articulate the, the U.S. context. So, you know, to kind of re-articulate that seemingly innocent question about the ineffability of the world, thinking about the U.S. question, uh, the U.S. context, um, the question could be, um, reframed to be, uh, re, uh, reframed to ask, how can there be racism when we're trying so hard to not be racist? Um, and so Moss's Moss, Moss answer to the, to the cash question in particular is derived from that network thinking, but that network thinking interdigitated with political economy. Um, and that's and it's to think about how identities are, quote, produced interactively, even though such identities are also a, constra a constraint on agency. And so at the end of the paper where um, he starts going, he, we get um, anthropologists in particular get a bit of chastising for not paying attention to caste uh, in the structuring, the very structuring of the economy. Something that he intimates that other scholars, and I'm kind of reading that these are economists, have done more effectively than us. Um, and the paper then there, therefore kind of raises some questions about concept work. Uh, when exactly are we talking about identity versus difference versus caste versus something else? Like, and does it matter? Like, does it, does it matter that these are interchangeable? Like, what is it, what is the concept work you want us to kind of think with? And the reason perhaps why I asked is particularly at the end of the paper where, where we kind of see this argument going in, in the text, is that it seems like network, um, it's really kind of about network and identity broadly construed, broadly constructed, that we should cons be concerned about and not kind of cast as such, is where, I mean, where I saw the paper kind of going. Um, and maybe I'm prompted to maybe ask these questions um, because what um, Moss, a lot of what Moss had to say about caste resonates with my experiences working in the Northeast um, and North Bengal, um, particularly with Indian Nepalis or Gorkhas. And in the, Dar Dar the Darjeeling district of West Bengal, there's a substantial movement for, uh, to achieve ST status, to achieve reservations. First, right, historically, that was first for individual groups, whether they be Tamangs, uh, Rais, Gurung, Sherpa, et cetera. Um, and later, kind of historically, for Gorkhas as a whole, for Indian Nepalis as a whole, as themselves a tribal group. Um, and so, the, the, therefore, the ca caste as a development issue is not necessarily the question where I work, is tr tribe is the question. And, and um, tribe is, is often construed as more of a quest than something to kind of, uh, you know, to, to, the, 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 something to be attained. Um, and so the, you know, the people I work with clearly saw SD status, they clearly saw reservations as an economic market relation, right? It was very clearly an economic market relation. Um, and maybe that kind of challenges some of the things that you say in your paper. But as they also saw as reservations as a market relation, something that would get them jobs, something that would in, in, envelop them in the market in different ways than they were then, um, they also saw it as a practice, right? A tribal status in particular. Something that had to be performed to the very bureaucrats or policy makers charged with evaluating their authenticity, particularly during that reviewing for ST status. And so what Samajas hoped to achieve, though through literally singing and dancing, was, that they, was what they termed development. 
Economic mobility was at the heart of recognition, as was identification. So in Darjeeling, in the end, the move to SD status lost out politically to a sub-nationalist movement for the establishment of a separate state of Gorkaland. Time and again, Gorkaland leaders extolled both the strength of a broad Nepali network uh, that the, and, and they promised that statehood would bring development in a far more effective way than the fracture that ST status might entail. Um, and my interlocutors obviously knew that, you know, achieving Gorkha land or getting ST status were fundamentally different things and di achieved through different processes, but they looked at them both, again, kind of fundamentally at essence, about economic, um, op economic opportunity and about market relations and about including, inclusion both in that market that was um, kind of hard to, to get at for them and also inclusion in a nation writ large. And so I bring up this comparison to kind of think more with networks. Nepalis, too, are heavily reliant on inter-ethnic uh, social connections, networks for jobs, marriages, and economic opportunity, and that may be fairly obvious. Um, and the thing about networks and network thinking is that the people we as anthropologists or field workers in general, um, what we can look at is how people cut their networks uh, in Marilyn Strathern's sense. Um, and how they kind of cut their networks to serve different aims at different times. Uh, you know, so you kind of in the paper, kind of in the beginning, kind of talk about the concealment of those networks, and then kind of later how inclusion using those networks is actually a detriment to social progress. But the question also remains is how do you do both at the same time, right? How do you cut a network um, in Strathern's kind of sense? And you know, for for my case, right? I, I know, there's there's there exa is examples that could that that I could describe as well. But just to kind of close up, you know, what I think that this this paper does uh, you know does well, and I think that can we can kind of think with in terms of thinking about anthropology and difference and inequality is that from the perspective from of below, right? That that attends to both networks and political economy as interdigitated, whether they're in Alapuram or Darjeeling, whether they're Dalits or uh, Gorkas, we can see how our inter, uh, we can see how our interlocutors and the complexity of everyday life rejects conceptual divides between inequality, identity, and exchange or the market. Right? Those are not neatly held. What it means to be Gorka in my field site, or perhaps what it might mean to be Saharia in Rajasthan, uh, where Brigu works, or Dalit in Alapuram, uh, in, is inseparable from, is part of what it means to be a tea plantation worker or a far, or formally bonded laborer. Right, so this in talk that then was kind of was very generative for me to kind of think about those concepts um, together. Uh, but largely because it could be read as a kind of generic framework for understanding how Moss, uh, as he describes at the, at the end of his paper, how po poverty exposes people to caste humiliation. Um, and you can kind of think about the interchangeability of that caste there, uh, substituting racial, gender, tribal, subnational, or caste humiliation. And this point, uh, this points us to the fact that the hardest forms of identity, economy, entanglement to analyze and address are those maintained across private and public spheres. They're both out in the open and implicit and shadowy. They're both at the same time. So again, not being a scholar of caste, uh, but someone who's deeply interested in the relationship between inequality and identity in India, uh, I'd like to ask Professor Moss to kind of push us more about the concept work that he's doing here. Um, and how do we conceive of caste intellectually when we know exactly who's being discriminated against? Um, and, how, and what is it that you would like us to think differently about, how would you like us to think about differently about difference writ large or discrimination more generally? Thank you. Getting some pushback from the anthropologists also, uh, asking you in a way in Bhavani is quite powerful. We might think of it at least one aspect of what you're saying as a Weberian formulation that it's a mistake to think about economy as subtracted from ethics or um, ethics and economics in whether we call it a cultural formation or a theological problem, caste, what is its relation to economy and are we subtracting uh, culture from the picture, and if not, then how would cultural logics re-enter? And similarly, Sarah is also, in some ways, pushing you to think about the question of difference and how one would think about caste in relation to seemingly neighboring concepts. Um, and is it purely a form of network analysis that we have then? 
So if we have two options, one is to give you uh, a brief uh, a response to Bhavani and Sarah, and then maybe open it out for questions, mm. if that's okay. That, that sounds good, a good idea. Yeah. Um, thank you both for your very uh, rich um, uh, comments and um, uh, actually helpful in, in, in challenge me to think about some of these things further. I'll, I'll probably just pick out a few points rather than try to go through them all. We could, um, because I think, um, first of all, um, the, this, this question about uh, the, cultural, the cultural logic that, that you, you said that has been sort of set aside, and, and the importance of, 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 of cultural mobilization, of the, the work of culture in creating uh, political space and mobilizing Dalits. That, and I wouldn't want my argument here to be seen as, as a challenge to that. Um, in fact, if, if one were to place what I was saying in terms of the longer history, just taking the village case for the moment, uh, what I'm sort of contrasting is an earlier period in which uh, culturally or forms of mobilization around identity, and, and I mentioned it briefly, in, in, in the lecture that what was described at the present moment would not have applied in the 1960s and 70s when the organization, the mobilization around, around Dalits and around Dalit identity, um, a, a reframing of, a, of an independent identity, a way of, of challenging the sort of dependencies that existed was, was absolutely fundamental and remains so in many places. But what I was trying to get at was in some circumstances, um, there is a shift, and I, like it's a bit. Fr my answer is going to be a bit frustrating because it's really a, a, an attempt to focus not on the questions of, 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 of cultural politics, but to really make the point about what a focus on cultural politics, not what it doesn't do, but what it what it therefore we're not paying attention to. So I think what I don't disagree with with what you're saying, and I think it's an, there's a more apt uh, description in the, the analysis that I've provided of a, of a particular village, in fact over 150, uh, 200 years, shows the very points at which that kind of cultural identity process was absolutely fundamental to what was happening and the processes of, of, of change and the challenging of, of, of power. And it's also important to recognize that I'm talking about a change in a public representation of caste. I'm not saying that there is a caste order which has disappeared that was there. I'm saying that whatever was there was always a complex range of things that, were, that was argued about in terms of a particular kind of representation. Caste as an order, as a system, as a, as a, as a sim symbolic and ceremonialized system, um, was, was a way of, of uh, an idiom through which um, various struggles of, of, of power and inequality and justice would be, would, 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 would be contested. Um, the argument that that is no longer the principal means through which disputes take place is not to say that that, that order has, was present now and has disappeared. Mm. That's the argument I'm arguing against, is that there was, a, there was an order which has now been eroded by processes of, of, of modern economic uh, transformation. I'm trying to suggest that the order itself, whether in villages or elsewhere, is a, is a representational structure. Um, but there's a change in the nature of the way in which caste relationships uh, come to be contested. And, and in which there is a certain kind of misrecognition in the mm -hmm. sense that there are, the processes are less evident uh, because of the way they are alloyed with other things that are going on, which of course is also true in the past, but I think there's something distinctive about the present moment. So that's on the... On, on, on the um, Cultural. Do tell me to stop if you want to open it up. For, mm. for, Maybe for, for. Mm, you can take a shot at uh, one more or shot, and then we okay. gather a few questions. Yeah, yeah, that, 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 that would be fine. Mm. Um, I, I'm, I'm glad that you can find a substitutability of caste with race or other things, because that, again, is precisely the point, mm -hmm. is that we need to find a way of talking about caste which doesn't 
uh, creates or is built on or acquires the exceptionalism mm -hmm. that has been the sort of the basis of discussions of mm -hmm. caste uh, at, 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 at every level. So to try and move towards a, a, a kind of way of understanding these processes of discrimination um, which, which do connect to other kinds of processes of discrimination and ethnicity and, and, and race, of, of course. And I think that's the challenge. Okay. Um, picking up on networks is just the beginning, and I have, mm -hmm. there's a lot more work to be done to try and follow that, that through. Um, but I think identity and networks are, do offer a, a way of, taking, of, of properly recognizing uh, some of the, the processes that are involved. They're not only economic networks. The networks I'm thinking about are, are, are social and cultural networks. Mm. They're linked in with other ways and styles and forms of, uh, of, of, of relating which, which connect to or don't connect to, to caste or apparently do or don't, mm. so that the way that caste comes to be interconnected with other kinds of network processes. So no, certainly not just mm -hmm. um, e economic networks, or that's what the economic, the economist literature begin to get us to think about in some more concrete and specific terms. That they don't take it that much further. Yeah. yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, and I think what's interesting about both discussions is they recognize the originality of what you're offering us here, but they're also reminding you that you're returning to a fundamental question of South Asian anthropology in some ways, that to which Dumont had offered the clearest formulation that things would move from hierarchy to contestation. Yeah in which you're offering a certain kind of quite strong counter proposition. Hmm. But what happens to the second end of the dyad is, I think, what they're yeah. both asking yeah. you to yeah. uh, conceptualize more distinctly. Hmm. Um, but hopefully... Which is helpful. Uh, yeah. 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 So maybe we can, uh, at this point, open ourselves out to further questions. And maybe because we have about 15-ish minutes, so what we'll do is take questions in pairs, if that's OK. Yeah, that's right and then give you a chance to respond. Um, so if people have uh, Jenna and then Ashu. I was, uh, in, you know, just wanted to ask you when you, ra when you raised the question or rather ended your talk that why caste is not addressed as a developmental issue or as a policy issue, uh, I would just like to ask you whether you think of course, so therefore, we do want to have caste addressed. And whether you think it's enough that caste should be addressed when we talk about you know, participation of Dalit men and women in the labor, in the in the market, and their economic transformation, or whether we need to ask a deeper question of not just caste, but caste and gender, and other forms of exclusions uh, within caste, uh, because you know, even your examples really showed that. Uh, the discrimination that Dalit women face is uh, multiple, um, and even other groups within um, um, uh, within Dalit groups, like people with disabilities, who are Dalit. So, therefore, is it enough to just uh, ask that caste should still be investigated as a developmental issue, but uh, not just other intersectionalities? Hold that thought. Yeah. For one more question, Ash. There's something uh, profoundly inviting about uh, the, the about the idea or the thought that we should start analyzing caste through the informal economy. This is a, a, a profoundly attractive invitation uh, for a very simple reason that 93% of Indian labor force in the is in the informal sector could have become 92 by now, but I doubt it. It's just still 93 stuck there because. Formal sector jobs have not gone up even after a very high growth rate. And uh, reservations would not only, it's not just about, are not only about the formal sector, but about the public formal sector, which means reservation debate is effectively about jobs for roughly 5% of the economy, 4 to 5% of the economy. And if we start thinking of uh, caste uh, through the informal economy, then, and what kinds of conceptual innovations or, uh, or improvements in understanding we'll have uh, is certainly a very, it's a very attractive mode of inquiry. So I, I'm, I'm deep in deep sympathy with the, the, fun, some, the fundamental line of inquiry opening up. 
and there, of course, Kevin Munshi, I don't recall whether, I think he's d dealing with informal economy also. Mm, he's simply yeah. dealing with cost, net worth, and economy. Yeah. Right? So that's a, that's a good way to think about that. But I would like to invite you, I think I probably should take one more minute and that's all. So we are running out of time. I, I'd like to invite you to think further about the conversation we began in my office, which is as a political scientist, um, and not just as a political economist, I also think about what politic, what how, what is how caste has shaped politics, right? And it has been a master narrative of Indian politics for a hundred years. Um, and uh, but the, the 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 master this master narrative of Indian politics built around caste and religion, two things, it says something revolutionary about caste, namely that no single caste can dominate in politics, numbers begin to matter. Therefore, castes begin to come together to exercise power. No single caste can do that. Right? So you begin to get caste. The term OBC, for example, is, is generated by the logic of, of democratic politics. Um, uh, or the idea that, that uh, upper OBCs or lower OBCs Right, this whole term of Dalits and uh, Mahadalits, this gen is generated by the logic of democratic <coughs> politics and how coalitions can be struck. Mm -hmm. So, if what kind of impact do you see of what the logic of democratic politics does to the experience of caste? Right, is the question where I invite your reflections because it simply cannot be reproduction of the cultural category. It simply cannot. Be. Because it makes no sense in democratic politics. You need to you need to put together coalitions in order to in order to make you either exercise power or make use of the availability or make use of the space of the democracy. Okay, should I respond? I mean, um, thank you. Two two very um, interesting points, um, Jenna. Yeah, um, thank thanks for that. I, I suppose um, the challenge is is precisely to move away from the sort of frameworks around special measures as it were to some uh, sort of broader framework that it could precisely be able to look at uh, intersectionalities um, so for example um, you know Congress MP Sashi Taro's uh, discrimination equality discrimination um, bill, bill. Uh, is is the sort of thing that would that would that would not be bound by by the special measures. It would look at um, the, this the, the social practices in a whole range of fields and the intersectionalities of the sort of thing you're you're describing, and would 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 have as it were duties for the promotion of equality as well as the specific sort of uh, you know prevention of atrocities type. Uh, let's say so. I think. I think that's the sort of uh, would strike me as a kind of progressive response to the to, to the question that you you've raised. If I if I've understood it uh, if I've understood it right. Um, and and Ashutosh, thank. Um, I'm not entirely sure whether I've grasped your the the the, the point. I, I, except, I mean, am I right in thinking that partly what we're talking about here is the way in which uh, politically shaped um, identities are the necessary means by which people come to perceive and construe their interests and that this uh, and to argue and and, and, for, and and to contest their interests and therefore there is a sort of um, uh, that the uh, and, and um, you know the, the, the way in which because of the way the political system works and the, the various mediating and brokering there are that that the diversity of phenomena that constitute everyday life are gathered together and constituted in particular kinds of identities um, it, for the political processes, which necessarily then have to sort of disentangle themselves in, in, in everyday life. I mean, Bruno Latour talks a bit about this kind of process of, uh, of the making of political and the, and, the, uh, and the fact that having made something political, it, it is of necess necessity somehow disengaged from other, other things that it has to be re reconnected to through the mediating processes of various um, political entrepreneurial type, uh, type figures. Because the question for me is, is how do these political identities and the struggles around them, how do they, how do they draw in 
the widest range of, 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 um, of human opportunity, the things that, that structure uh, opportunities that, 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 um, that people have or strive for. I don't know if that made any yeah. sense. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. And so now, just to make your task slightly more difficult, we're going to take a try at a triptych okay. rather than two, because we're slightly running out of time. So uh, we could start with. There are others. No, no, no. Yeah, it's no, fine. No, that's good. That's good. Uh, I'm a practitioner, so this is always uh, you know, absorbing what these sessions say takes some amount of effort from our side. But I found it um, extremely enlightening. Uh, having been having worked in India and with you know, in, in some of our institutions, with the communities, a lot of what you said just resonated at a practical level. And like Ashutosh said, I think uh, using the prism of understanding economic opportunity through caste, I think is a very powerful uh, idea and requires a lot more uh, work to be done. My question for you is specifically on caste and business economy. Could it be that what we are witnessing is only the first phase of a multi-iteration process. That therefore what Dalits, for example, are bringing into the business economy are the legacies of disabilities because of everything that you've mentioned, which disadvantages them to participate as effectively as, let's say, the other castes. Because those rules of the game are already established and they've played it many times before. Uh, but in the first iteration of this, the Dalits are not as successful and as effective in gaining the successes that the other castes have had. And for us to truly see how this plays out, we'll have to see this happen on more iterations. So therefore, the question is, if, if what I'm saying is true, then it's not the rules of the business economy per se that are amplifying the disabilities of Dalits, but the legacy disabilities that Dalits are bringing into this. And if that's true, then there are ways to ameliorate that, there are ways to address those disadvantages. Mm -hmm. But in and of itself, the business economy can actually be a force of good. Uh, and so that's that's the question. That's also Chandraman Prasad's argument. It's he would agree with you, he would say yeah. something as major Dalit actors. Yeah. <clears throat> oh no. I was wondering uh, what you thought of uh, in terms of the relationship between aesthetic life in India and, and, and caste was, uh, not just in terms of, of singing and dancing to authenticate uh, tribal identity, but also uh, within sort of uh, classical traditions of performance, which, which, are, which are very, very Brahminical, both in their uh, modes of teaching and learning and in their sort of ways of performance and I know TM Krishna does some uh, some work in this regard um, uh, in Chennai uh, in how he's sort of opposing kacheri culture and the status of sort of instrumentalists um, uh, through their sort of caste identities. Um, so and I was wondering whether you, uh, what you thought of sort of looking at this, uh, at, at this kind of aesthetic space as a space of development um, um, and, and perhaps as a kind of uh, informal economy almost um, of aesthetic labor and, and say cultural capital and what potential this space had for, for, for sort of developmental issues in that sense. Um, yeah, I think, to, uh, so thanks for that, that point. I, I think the, the message that I would want to uh, put across is that the processes in um, in, in, in the economy are not all one-sided. There are simultaneous things going on that both dissolve um, aspects of, uh, of, of caste and at the same time, and as Barbara Harris White argues, and in the same sites, um, reproduce them. And so it's not one, it's not one thing, um, it's not one thing or the other. And actually to pick up on the idea about what people bring in, um, it's more a question of what, um, what, the, what a certain value system establishes as the differentially valued spaces, markets, and so on. So the point, I think, was you, you made yeah, that, that right. point earlier about, about um, it's, it's, in, in fact, direct discrimination sometimes is not required because the, the valuing of spaces, markets, 
and so on, exactly. does, it, does, does the job already. Those things are there. But those aren't properties that are brought by um, communities of historical disadvantage. They are a reproduction in a, in a modern different range of settings of precisely the kinds of categorizations and the social valuings that, um, that, that, that have, have existed at, uh, at different times and continue despite and in more, in more hard to recognize, uh, recognize ways. So, and those, are, those processes um, that are, are different, again, from the network processes. So the network processes and the cultural uh, valuing of spaces and markets and, and ranking and so on are, 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 different, are different things. So I think that there are several different phenomena um, that, that would need to be examined in, in this investigation, uh, bringing, uh, hopefully, more anthropologists to work alongside the economists looking at the, looking at the in, in, informal economy. I think the, um, the question of aesthetic life, and uh, I mean, that really takes off a, a, different, a, a different track, but the, the short answer is, is that um, redefining um, the, uh, you know, the realm of aesthetics and, 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 and finding ways of honoring um, forms of cultural practice that had been dishonored uh, is a central part of the cultural politics of the Dalit movements. Um, and uh, has long been the case. And it's often very specifically taking the very things that have been the signs and symbols of subordination, for example, the pare or tape drum, um, and making that an art form. The, I the idea of creating a Dalit art, an art is something, to conceive of something as art, requires that you have disembedded it from a set of relationships which are unequal and, and discriminatory. And uh, so in a sense, it's, those processes are, are central. Now, those processes themselves sometimes um, define that realm as distinct from other forms of pre-existing Brahmanic cultural practices and say, well, you know, we want more of a level playing field. So I think this is, you know, the, the NGOs that I will be talking about on Friday um, make considerable use, although I won't be talking about this aspect of their work, considerable use of, of, of cultural uh, uh, forms, uh, performances um, in, their, in their kind of reworking of, of development. And that's actually just to sort of flag another sort of self-advertisement when I will come back to this question of how it is that caste comes to be included or excluded, uh, the question, the sort of Ferguson-type mm -hmm. question you asked. I'll come back to that um, in, in that lecture. Okay, wonderful. Uh, Patrick, since we have a couple of minutes left, do you want the last uh, question or the privilege of, as the deepest, uh, as the closest reader of Pierre Bourdieu, do you want to tell us the concept of misrecognition that uh, David is missing here? This is fine. Okay. So, uh, but, mm, I mean, before thanking you, we'd still, I would say, let's hold on to the thought that has emerged, which is quite interesting. Uh, and it's a real privilege when a lecture does offer us kinds of new thoughts. And one aspect that is absolutely central is this issue of how one understands caste in relation to informal economy, as Ashu is emphasizing. And that's really a promising line of inquiry for many of us, uh, myself included in my new field work, and thinking about how, for Muslims also, it's a central feature of the informal economy is caste. Uh, and this element that both Bhavani and Sarah are naming and pushing you towards, mm. I don't think either of them is reading it as that you reduced it to purely economistic or economic processes. No. But they're emphasizing mm. that you are asking a deeply anthropological question also, which is this aspect of the ineffable, as mm. Sarah is saying, that basically you're taking us through different concentric circles, almost village, city, international aid agency, where in each circle something is missed, the actual existence of prejudice is missed by naming it as something else mm. or missing it. Mm. So they're asking you to think further on what that misnaming or what the mm. obstacle is, uh, because it certainly isn't the Dumont answer that we move from hierarchy to contestation, but what we've moved for is uh, unclear, but I think you've offered us at least uh, a very fruitful set of leads. So thank you so much, and really let me reiterate what a privilege it is to have you here, and particularly on a day like this, when uh, we, it's inspiring for all of us. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you.